we do each as individuals, we can each do a lot. Like we can each make a difference. And I know that sometimes you just have to know one person that helps you to change your mind about something, right? Like we've all kind of experienced that in one form or another. And a lot of these problems that are happening, they're on a systemic level, but they're also happening on an individual internal level. So I hope it gives people a sense of agency that we can each do something about it by just working on ourselves. Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast, where each week we talk about ideas for raising kids who become thriving adults. I'm your host, Audrey Monkey. Here on the podcast, I share my experiences raising five kids who currently range in age from 16 to 26 and working with thousands more as a summer camp director over the past three decades. I'm the author of Happy Campers, and I frequently do workshops with parents, teachers, and summer camp professionals about social skills, connection, and happiness, topics I researched extensively for my master's in psychology. If you want tools for raising kind, optimistic, self-reliant kids who become thriving adults, you've come to the right place. Hey, Sunshine Parenting listeners. Welcome to episode 143. This episode is first being released on Friday, June 12th, 2020. I've lost track of what week this is in ISO for the Rona, but we've been in it for a very long time. Before we get to this week's interview, which I think you're really going to enjoy, I want to share my one simple thing tip for this week. For most kids, school is over and it's finally summer, which is normally a season full of really fun activities like summer camps and lifeguard programs and things like that. Unfortunately, due to COVID, many of those programs we love are canceled this summer. So here's an idea of something you can do this week or in the next few weeks to figure out how to make this summer still fun. Have a family brainstorm where you talk about different ideas people have of fun things that you want to try or learn this summer. These can be group activities or just individual things that you each are interested in possibly doing this summer. It's really great if you as the parent go first and share a couple of things that you're really wanting to do this summer for fun. It could be that you or your kids want to get better at something like a musical instrument or some kind of art. Or it could be that you're interested in trying something new like gardening or some kind of craft. Brainstorming the list will give you ideas for possible fun family activities to do maybe once every week or so. It also may give you ideas of how you can support your child trying out some new hobbies and interests this summer. This is definitely going to be a summer unlike any any of us have ever had before. So let's try to make the best of it and plan in a little bit of fun and maybe some new things. My guest this week on the podcast is Alex Gamboa Grand. Alex is the co-founder of Good Intent, an online shop offering sustainable alternatives to everyday essentials like home goods, cleaning supplies, and personal care products. Alex is also the program manager at Portland State University's School of Business, where she provides support for underrepresented entrepreneurs in the Portland area who want to grow their businesses. I've had the pleasure of knowing Alex for the past 20 years as a camper and then as a staff member at my camp. Last week, Alex posted a message on Facebook for her family and friends. This is what she said. I just wanted to throw this out there that if anyone has any questions about everything going on and feels like having a conversation with a black person could be helpful, I am more than happy to talk. Not everyone is, and that's totally fair, because this is a really exhausting and draining and enraging time for people of color, quite frankly, and it's 100% true that it's not anyone's job to do that work for you, but I'm personally volunteering. I strongly believe that actual open, honest conversations where we're willing to be wrong and learn from each other is one of the quickest ways to heal our many divisions. 
and I am eager to have those conversations about a wide variety of topics. Not that I am or should be the spokesperson for the entire black community or on any other topic, but I'm here and always happy to talk, especially if you feel like you don't have someone else to talk to. It's one of my favorite things, actually. Text, direct message, Zoom, whatever. Also, if you have someone in your life who you're close to that you've been afraid to reach out to because you don't want to burden them, sending a text or something letting them know you're thinking about them or just asking how they're doing might be a good way to show them your support and let them decide how much they're comfortable sharing. I've really appreciated those who have reached out to me and given me an opportunity to share how I feel and also been willing to ask tough questions. After I saw Alex's post, I reached out to her and invited her to come on my podcast to have one of those chats she so enjoys having and I really wanted to have this week. So I'm excited to bring you this week's chat with Alex Gamboa Grant. Well, I am so excited. This is really a treat for me today on the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. I have one of my former campers and former staff members from camp. Um, Her camp name is Luna, but I'm going to let her introduce herself with her real name. (laughs) Welcome. (laughs) My name is Alex Gamboa Grand, and uh, I started coming to camp when I was 10, and I went for six years. and. which was really awesome, like really some of the best years of my life. And then I also um, came back as a counselor when I was 21, I believe, and worked for four years, I think three full summers and a couple maybe like shorter. Maybe I could went, am I, did I come for longer? I'm not sure. <laughs> but I spent a lot of my summers at Gold Arrow Camp for sure. Yes. And you, um, you met someone kind of significant over your years at camp. Talk about that a little bit. Yes, I did. I met my husband um, actually my first year um, as a counselor in 2011. And honestly, a lot of my still really good friends from all over the world. I, camp has been a really amazing experience. I mean, for like many, many reasons, camp has been an amazing experience. But now I've actually been reflecting about how amazing it is to have this global network of people um, who it really has allowed me to connect with people from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, Actually, I was just talking to a friend of mine this week, um, Flick, who um, is from Australia, that, um, you know, worked at camp, I think in 2011 as well. And she's been asking me all these questions about what's going on. Actually, Australians are very aware um, and informed about American culture and politics, like sometimes more than I am, even though I'm like pretty knowledgeable too. But Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about a lot of these issues that have been going on lately. She said that her mom has been following me and has been learning a lot from me. So it's, you know, it's been really amazing how much like this network has grown and how many like really valuable, authentic relationships have come from that, including my husband, Crokey, uh, Colby Grand. Yeah, that's so, so great. So, well, the reason that we're talking today and that I had you on the podcast was because you posted probably last week at some point, um, just commenting on the, just all the racial talk, tensions, anti-racist information, go, which is good going on right now and the protests and everything. And you said, I can't remember the exact words, but basically if anyone wants to talk to me, I'm available. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about your racial background so that it's like in context? Yeah. Um, so I, um, I'm from Los Angeles area and my, my mom and my mom's side of the family identify as black and my dad's side of the family is um, Costa Rican. My dad moved um, to LA from Costa Rica when he was two years old. So the first generation uh, American citizen. And so I grew up with like this um, just being kind of different. (laughs) I mean, I have um, relatively light skin, but I have this Latina side of me and this black side of me. And um, for a long time, I just kind of considered myself to be other. But, you know, since, let's say, like college and definitely in the last few years, I've really learned and like recognized the importance of owning both of those identities more so and also kind of using using that. as a way to share those, both of those cultures with the, the people in my life. A lot of the environments I'm in are 
predominantly white. And so I realized that, you know, my identity and being for many people, one of the only people of color that they know or have a close relationship with, I realized it's an opportunity to help share that perspective with people since I do have it. And I also know that a lot of people really don't have anyone else to talk to you about this, this kind of thing. So, um, and I know a lot of a lot of people, a lot of black people don't feel comfortable talking about it, don't feel like it's their responsibility to educate anyone. And I 100% understand that because it is, it's enough. <laughs> it's enough dealing with it all individually. But I, um, I just feel so much that there is an opportunity for me to help connect with people and help people understand perspectives that they may not have any other ties or connection to. So that was a big reason why I decided to do that. For a long time, I didn't think about it much. Um, and it wasn't until, and I didn't like being confronted with my race for like when I was a young person. I like, I remember there was one time in um, like elementary school where there is actually more times than not actually a negative experience might come, might have come from like a black person who didn't understand um exactly if i was really black or like they were confused by it and so i was antagonized a little bit from that side but then in high school i i i remember assuming that people just didn't know what i was because people used to always ask me what are you i would literally have people stare at me in class and stuff and just say what are you anyway <laughs> but then i had actually um i had a boyfriend and one boyfriend in high school that told me that one of his friends said why are you dating a black girl you shouldn't be dating a black girl he was white I had another white boyfriend that said that his parents wouldn't be okay with him dating me. Um, and those were like some of the first op first times that I'd ever been really um, hit with that. And, um, and I've had this kind of transformation with my own, own identity over time because I realized people, some people, I, I'd probably at least assume that I'm part black, right? Um, and most time people don't bring it up, but um, but it's something that's lingering behind in some people's minds. And some people, they don't think about it at all. And I've had experiences where people will say things in front of me that are racist in nature. And it's like, I'm thinking about, thinking to myself, like, did they even realize that they said that in front of me? Do I, like, do, they, uh, do I not count or something that they would feel comfortable saying those kinds of things? So I've kind of had, this wide variety of experiences where it comes from different angles. Actually at camp, when I was a counselor, um, you know, often I, I, I think um, my first year, in fact, as a counselor, only me and one other counselor, um, Huckle, he, we were the only um, black counselors. And we, you know, to be fair, we both have curly hair and I have a similar complexion, but I had multiple campers come up to me and ask, ask are we dating or are we brother and sister? <laughs> Multiple. <laughs> and there are things like that that made me realize like, oh, some people are in their minds very confused by what I am and they're trying to wrap their heads around it, even though I thought that we just had this neutral conversation. And sometimes when they don't notice, it's not a good thing. So I, I kind of have this like wide range of experiences <laughs> with race. But I have learned that I would rather um, walk into a room and own those things because I can do more good with that than bad, especially when I'm the only person of color in the room. And a lot of people don't encounter that very often. And I often, I actually thought about writing a book called Surrounded by White People because <laughs> that's just a big part of my life and like about a lot of the experiences I have are kind of painted by that. And, you know, there's so many layers. <laughs> Well, I can help you with that. That's so good. I know about writing books. So we could, you could, you should start with just little essays and stories about some of your different interactions, but you, you covered a really important point, which, um, so when I was raised, which was the seventies and eighties, the concept was teaching color blindness, meaning you don't talk about it because it doesn't matter. Like we're all the same on the inside and we're all going to be friends. And, you know, and so, um, so that was my experience. And so and my friends of different races, I didn't sit down with them and say, so, you know, what's it like being Hispanic? What's it like being black? You, we didn't do that. 
we, we socialized and we, you know, lived our life and we did our thing, but we didn't have those conversations because none of us of any race, I don't think in the eighties, I don't think any of us were raised with like, here's, you need to think about these things. Here's, you know, these books about it. You know, we didn't. Um, so, and now of course they've found that that was not the correct way to educate people, especially children, because people notice. So like the kids at camp asking if you and Huckle were related or dating, it's like, that's just one of those things that you're going, wait, why are you asking me that? Oh, you're kind of noticing this thing, which I'm trying to like, some people don't seem to even notice. And it's like, it, like, of course you notice it, but you learn not to note, like not to acknowledge even that you notice it, even internally, maybe like, maybe you don't even, you know, um, so where we are now, obviously we're all learning a lot. What is your perspective on like for parents? And, you know, a lot of my listeners are parents or camp professionals or teachers, what is the direction that we need to go now, especially in talking to our kids? Like what would have helped you when you were young? Um, like what conversations, what, what would have been more helpful at camp, at school, at home that would have helped you feel more comfortable with conversations, with like, you know, addressing when people said comments that were racist, that kind of thing? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. It's really hard <laughs> because there's a lot to that, but one, I, I'll take it back a little bit. Um, one of the things that has, that really woke me up, um, and made me reflect a lot recently was hearing about the situation with, um, in Central Park with that, the woman, Amy Cooper, who, um, was calling the police on, um, the black man that was telling her to that she shouldn't have her dogs off leash in the park or whatever. And um, to me, that was a, like, I got a, a very direct impression that that woman probably didn't think of herself as being racist. But I think that that is more like what a lot of people have going on inside. That um, they, they don't know that they have that inside of them. Actually, Glennon Doyle, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with her, yeah. but she, she didn't, um, she has this quote and she did an Instagram post, um, about it recently where she said, you know, everyone is filled with something. We're all like cups and, you know, we could be filled with coffee. We could be filled with tea, but if we, when we get bumped, that's, what's going to spill out. And a lot of us don't realize all the ways that we are filled with, um, with all these messages that we've internalized that we are so unaware of. And, um, the reason why I, I got this, like something clicked that there's a lot of Amy Cooper's out there is because I hear it all the time and people that are very well-intentioned, um, and white people that are very well-intentioned that they still do have fear, um, of people of color or uh, specifically black men, I guess I'll, I'll say, or they, I can hear that they are, they still see people of color as being novelties or they're otherizing people in their minds and they don't realize it's negative. But to me, there are a few things that I think that we should all be trying to do more. And one of those things is, um, is really humanizing each other. And I think that we do that um, by practicing and, and go going out of our comfort zones a little bit to practice empathy you know, a lot of us are still living in very segregated environments. Um, I actually have realized that even about, you know, I'm from Los Angeles, like I said, and a lot of my friends, a lot of my white friends don't have any other friends that are people of color, even though they live in one of the most diverse cities in the country. Um, a lot of my black friends don't really interact with many white people. Um, and a lot of our communities are like that. And so we actually, you know, we might interact with people of other ethnicities like sometimes we might know somebody we might have a coworker or something but we're not really having authentic conversations where we're really seeing the humanity in other people and if you don't do that um it makes it really hard in those moments that that take you off guard to recognize that and i'll give like a couple of example, examples of that actually even the police like the police officers that you know have killed um, these black people, I, you know, I think in some cases those people might be 
overtly racist. Um, we know that, that that does exist, but I think a lot of the times there's actually genuine fear or something that they're dealing with, right? And the fear isn't right. The fear is coming from a place that they might not really realize is even there. But the, I think one of the only ways that you can undo that is by interacting with people who are different. It's by watching movies and reading books where you're understanding what the perspective of other people is like. So I think for parents, that's something that I would try to be really conscious about is making sure your kids are exposed to people who are different. And that can be really hard because of the nature of you know, our, society, our societies and cities and schools that they still are so often segregated whether that was intentional or not. Um, so I think that that's a really important point. And I also think, um, I think something that probably most white people don't realize is that people of color are often going out of their way to make them comfortable. And um, I was actually just listening to a friend of mine from college um, is a black man. He actually is a coach for the NBA. And he was doing a panel with other um, black psychotherapists and um, mental health professionals. And they were kind of breaking down what, you know, what this experience has been like. And something that they talked about, my friend, he said that every time he walks into an elevator with white people, he feels like he has to disarm himself. He has to say, hey, how's it going? How are you, how are you all doing? Because he knows that people automatically are afraid of him. And I do it even though I don't think fear, I don't think um, that's as much of what comes into the room with me, but I'm always trying to make people feel comfortable. I'm always trying to resist stereotypes that people have. And I also don't like to rock the boat. Nobody likes to be the one, if someone does say something that's incorrect or that's, you know, that rubs you the wrong way, nobody wants to be the one to say that's not okay. I, you know, I, for example, I've been at, um, I was at like a, a friend's house once. It was a game night. There was maybe 10, 12 people there. And I was the only person of color in the room. And there was somebody that, um, that I just met that was telling a story about how there was a, you know, a cyclist that got cut off by a driver and the cyclist went over to the car and knocked on the window and tried to talk to the driver and the driver. And he said not to be racist, but the driver was black. And he said that to imply that we should understand that this was a scary situation because the driver was black and who knows what could happen. And I'm in the room thinking, oh, like, <laughs> I'm thinking so many things. First of all, I'm, I'm processing like, okay, no, there, that wasn't right. <laughs> I'm trying to think like, should I give this guy the benefit of the doubt? But I'm like, no, that really wasn't right. But I just met him. Am I going to ruin the whole vibe of this party, this casual conversation by jumping in to say something? Um, and I think so often, even people of color don't, don't say anything because they're worried about making white people uncomfortable. Um, even, you know, if it's your close friends, nobody wants to be the one to imply, like you said something wrong because we know what the implications there's like so many layers to all of this. <laughs> well, and I was thinking too, it's also a personality thing because we all have our own personalities, right? And mm -hmm. whether, regardless of, you know, what race you are, you either, you might have that personality. I have that too, where you, you don't want to make people uncomfortable. You know, it don't, you don't really love being confrontational. And so mm -hmm. I guess it's like also this balance of people need to be more empathetic and sensitive. And we can't really expect people to always just like, you know, be super direct and, but hopefully with your friends. And that's what it goes back to. Like, if you are close enough with someone where you can say, um, you know, that, that just want to like kind of debrief about what you said earlier, because I just want you to know that that the way you said that, this is how mm -hmm. I felt and this is how it came yeah. across to me. But I think you're right. Going back to that first thing, I, I heard someone speak, um, on, like I said, it was like a sermon and he said, that we need to stop with this whole thing about like serving others and more think about kinship with others. Like, mm -hmm. and that's what, when you were talking, I was like, that's what it is. It's about becoming friends with people and getting close enough where you can be authentic and you can be on to, honest and you can address those things and be more direct because you have that safety and security of the relationship. 
And you, I think even so, even with that, I think that it would be really helpful if I knew that my friends were open to hearing that kind of feedback too, because um, that's something that I was realizing is even with people that I'm close with, I feel the implications of racism are really bad, right? Like, we, <laughs> okay, this is a whole, let me, so here's something else that I've been reflecting on a lot lately is that I think that we have this kind of binary of like being a good person and a bad person. And we associate racism with being like, you can only be a racist if you're a bad person. And nobody, very few people, if anyone thinks of themselves as being a bad person. But if you say that someone did something racist, you're like, that has been the implication. So it, um, that's really difficult. I, first of all, don't believe in this binary of a good person and a bad person because, um, you know, people who are, you know, a good person can still do a bad thing, basically. Um, and I think that we often see ourselves and each other in those binaries still. I think that we often see people who commit crimes as being a bad person. I think that we see people that we, that look like people we know we assume that they're a good person and this happens in the criminal justice system all the time right like think about um you know obviously we know the like negative side of this that people jump to conclusions assume this person has a gun or is a threat to them and they sometimes those the them jumping jumping to that conclusion can literally end someone's life and we also see the opposite side of this where like there's the example of brock turner who was um um you know the um, a white man from that was a student at Stanford University who who um, raped a woman and he got a very light sentence like three months or something and the judge you know basically said this is a good kid he has a lot of he has a you know he has a lot of potential he, I don't want to ruin his life and so we it's easy sometimes for us to see that goodness in people that we can connect to Maybe it looks like someone we know and we're like, oh, this is like somebody who's just trying, they just messed up one time. But we should really be giving all everyone that same empathy. And so I think on one hand, we need to be doing that for each other. We need to be assuming the best about each other. We need to be recognizing that everyone is a human that has a family and they might be a good son. They might, you know, be a good coworker, like work really hard and they might mess up sometimes that doesn't make them a bad person that doesn't mean we should lock them up and throw away the key like we need to see people as humans but then on the flip side of that we need to also understand that we are all capable of being wrong and i think that this is such like if i could say one thing about something we all need to work on right now it's this human like we need to work on our own humility and ability and openness to being wrong and to and to growing i think you know especially as like you know the election comes up we we often assume that we're right and other people are wrong, right? And we're, and um, if somebody implies that we're wrong, we get very defensive. Um, and, you know, it, it, this is really tricky because people rarely respond well to being told they're wrong, right? Like this is, like we kind of know that it's not working. <laughs> so it's, we have to go, we have to figure out like what ways to communicate with each other best, but it would be so much easier if we all were, went into a conversation being willing to, to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I just think that's something that we all kind of struggle with. It's so funny. Last night, our dinner table conversation with my family was, um, it was like a verse in Proverbs about like the wise man accepts reproof. And we just talked a lot about how like you, you become wise by listening to basically when someone who's wise gives you kind of life giving reproof. And that really, that what you were just saying is the same thing. I think all of us need both that, that ability to not judge people by their worst mistake, because none of us want to be judged by our worst mistake. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and in psychology, we don't judge ourselves by our worst mistake. When we do something wrong to ourselves, we're like, Oh, I'm a good person. I just made this one mistake. But mm -hmm. then when it's other people, we're like, Oh, he's the guy that robbed that thing or he's, right. you know, she's the one who did that. Um, and so that's a, that's a, that is a thing that we do naturally othering and, and also giving other people global because we want to like, 
in order to sort things in our mind, it's easier just to be like, oh, well, she's good. She's bad. He's good. You know, it's just like, whatever you're just, it's like simplifying everything to that point. And I think I don't, I was very, I've always been, it's very hesitant or like, I get really defensive because I want to do things right so badly that Mm -hmm. when someone gives me um, like feedback, I just, I get like kind of sad or feel bad. Right. And I think that's how most of us feel. Yeah. I think especially if we know that we had good intentions, right? If you're like, I didn't mean, I was trying to say something different. I didn't mean, mean it like that. I think that that's what we go to and we get mad at other people for not understanding us. That's how I feel. <laughs> at least for- yeah. Yeah. So I think like I have been really reflecting on, I want to have these conversations because, and I want people to know that I'm going to give you grace. Like it's okay if you say something wrong, as long as you're open to me telling you that and us working through it together because we, I don't expect any, I'm not wrong. I don't know everything. (laughs) Okay. So I think that we all need to just kind of own that, that we're all a work in progress that we have, we all have something to learn. Um, and we haven't obviously figured, nobody has figured everything out because if we, if we did, if we had a solution for every problem, hopefully we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. So yeah, I just like, I think that that's, really what a lot of us need to learn. I think that, you know, when I go to that binary of like being a good person or a bad person, I think that that exists in a lot of areas in our life too. I think that exists. Like we think we have to either be smart or dumb. So it's like when we're wrong, we feel like we're dumb. And so, and that doesn't line up with the person that we, that, with our identity that we have for ourselves in our minds, it's wrong or right, good or bad, smart or dumb. There's all these things. And we're like not open to like not being the one that we want to identify with. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how you teach that, but I think it's like the most important well, thing. Yeah. I think all of these things, well, I think for parents, I mean, that the insights that I'm getting from you are one, it's, it's an internal issue first. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. You know, it's an internal and really doing some reflection on, what are those, um, those things that I've done without realizing it, you know, mm-hmm. like, because I, I think of myself as a good person, but what have I done or said or thought that actually I need to work on and change yeah. and then, and then accepting and being and asking for feedback. I almost feel like if, if we can feel comfortable going to a friend and saying, okay, I, I want to do this better, please I'm, I'm going to not get defensive. Please let me know what I can do to always make you feel comfortable in our community, in our workplace, in our camp, whatever. Um, and that's just, I think we need to start having more of those conversations and making it like, I want, I want my kids to be those people who go when they're in a setting, they're asking everybody, what can I do? to help you feel comfortable here, you know, where, whoever you are and, um, whatever your background and, and making sure that people feel comfortable, not that they don't have to be someone they're not, they don't have to try to, you know, fit the mold, but they are welcome and they're welcome to share what they need or something like that. I totally agree. I, I really think that having like very open, authentic conversations is to me, like that's the, the most important thing we can be doing right now and moving forward obviously with the humility and stuff that I talked about, but I also, you know, something I've realized recently is how rarely I ever talk about my own identity or I talk about race with so many of my friends, even though I feel like I have a lot of friends I'm really close with. It's just not something we talk about. And there's so many things that we don't talk about because you know that this other person might not agree or that it might be a topic that makes them feel uncomfortable. And I, I think that we can all, do a better job at creating those spaces where we can talk very openly about those things. Um, and I think it has to be said explicitly. It's not just like a tone or a safe space. You have to say it because otherwise it's not always clear. And people, I think people of color, their default is to go out of their ways to make people feel comfortable. And I will also say it's, it's really important to not, um, think that you're off the hook. Like you were, you mentioned earlier, like there's, all these things that in your mind, you're like, well, I try to be a good person. I have, you know, I'm friends. I love, I might, I love some people of color. Like I, you know, I've never treated them poorly in my mind. Like I think a lot of people um, think that they're off the hook because of those things, but realize 
that are realizing now that they haven't ever really really supported the people in their lives in the way that they could really use the support. Um, and something that I started to be very aware of during in just the past couple of weeks is how many people in my life probably have let themselves off the hook because they're friends with me. They assume that that was enough, but like, really, we haven't dealt with it together. <laughs> like, I'm just one person and I'm making it easy. I actually had a, um, a, a former boss of mine just reached out to me recently who is white and he asked me, you know, did I ever make you feel uncomfortable in the workplace? Um, and he just, you know, was kind of asking me more questions about all of this and um, which is really great. And I realized that I, I, he asked me if there's any ever any like racist things that happened while I was there. And I thought like, no, but I've been going out of my way to make it comfortable for you so that it wouldn't be something you had to deal with. Like we don't talk about these things. I try to like come in and be as, um, you know, palatable as possible a lot of the time. I think that that's what a lot of people are doing. And so, um, and I think white people a lot of times don't realize that they're part of like the dominant culture that everyone else is trying to fit into. Um, and yeah. so in, in whatever ways you can like make room for people to be their most authentic selves, to talk about the things that you might be uncomfortable with, I think that that is really powerful. Um, I would love to be able to talk about these things more with the people, the white people that I know and love in my life. It's both difficult and empowering is the fact that we do each as individuals, we can each do a lot, like we can each make a difference. And I know that sometimes you just have to know one person that helps you to change your mind about something, right? Like we've all kind of experienced that in one form or another. And a lot of these problems that are happening, they're on a systemic level, but they're also happening on an individual internal level. So I hope it gives people um, a sense of agency that we can each do something about it by just working on ourselves like that. You can be doing it right home from during quarantine. You can be working on this and you can make things better. And especially if you work with kids or you have kids, that is so amazing that you can try to make sure it's better for the next generation. And so, and it really, I think at the end of the day, these open, honest conversations, growing empathy and exposing ourselves to different stories than our own and trying to unsegregate our lives as much as we can. Those things have so much power on top of all of the activism and, and like, you know, political actions that we can take. Those things have so much power. So I hope that people feel encouraged by that. Well, I do. So thank you. <laughs> I feel really encouraged and I'm just, um, you know, I'm grateful for you being willing to just kind of talk about these things because it isn't, you know, it's not something that we're, I, I'm not used to having these conversations and I'm, but I'm ready to, to go to the discomfort in order to learn and to, like you said, I think it's just something that it's, it's time to start talking about things that maybe no one taught us to talk about. Yeah. Oh, one other um, thing that I'll add too that is, is really helpful as an individual that you can do is like I said, like it's hard for the people of color to always be the one to speak up and say that some, somebody said something wrong or whatever. So it's really helpful if, if white people, if you're in the room, if we're not in the room and it's just you, or if, even if we are in the room to be the one to say it and to speak up um, because, you know, there's, there's more, there's power in that too. A lot of times if a person of color says like, excuse me, that was a little racist, that a lot of times, you know, people will be more defensive about it or, you feel, or they feel like you're playing the race card. But a lot of times if a white person says it, it has, it carries a different meaning or weight and it relieves some of that burden that is already way too much on people of color. So. Oh my gosh, that's so good. That's what I, I don't know if you saw the quote I shared last week, that um, that Albert Einstein quote that I always shared at the beginning of our Keeping Campers Safe session at camp, which was, the world is a dangerous place, not because people, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. It's the whole bystander thing right. that, um, that if there are people who can speak, like we all need to speak up. That's, the, that's basically what you're saying. Like, yeah, it's not, it's not your responsibility. If you're in a room full of people, it's all of our responsibility 
to be and to all hold the person accountable. Right, right. Or if someone points it out and you hadn't noticed it, to back them up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so if someone says something like, hey, you know what, the way you just said that, really came across in a way. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know if we want to, we have to think about our terminology so that people, hopefully we can say it in a way that they'll accept the reproof. Right. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know how we say it, but, um, but that is so, thank you for reminding us of that. And I think it's the same thing that we teach kids about when you bullying, Mm -hmm. any kind of abuse, bullying, anytime you see wrong being done, just because you're not doing it yourself, if you're observing it and not stopping it, that perpetuates the problem. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, because it, it's if, if nobody else is concerned, then it makes it seem like it's normal and it's reinforcing that behavior. And yeah, it's really hard to be the one all the time. But so if we yeah. just can relieve some of that pressure off of like people, yeah. people of color. And those, and those people who are really good at speaking up, like um, – I think we need to really back them up well. You know, you know, when you have those really direct friends who like just, you know, yeah. say it like it is to to then when they say it, to say, you know what, yes, I agree with you. Like, you know what I mean? Like be the be the upstanders or whatever who who side with the right. So well, Luna, this has been so great. Thank you so much for for coming on and for sharing your wisdom and your experience with my listeners. I know that this is gonna be an ongoing conversation and um I have a couple books that I want to read with you this summer, if you have time, and we can discuss them because I think there's a, if, since we have time, hopefully during COVID to still keep reading and, and discussing these things, because I just think we're all learning so much from this um, time. And as we talked about before we started recording, there's something about being quarantined with this mm-hmm. going on that possibly has kind of opened us all up to not turn away anymore. Yeah, I know for me personally, something I've been really, I, what I really want to start researching more too is, you know, what are some solutions to some of these problems? Like how, how, like, there are people that have been thinking about this for a lot longer in between all of these moments of, you know, emotion and grief, like what, you know, what ways can we, can we, you know, solve some of these problems? And so I also, and I think a lot of, you know, first sharing all these resources with white people, but I think people of color also realizing that, you know, we can't just sit around and wait for things to happen. People have been working on these things for a long time, but yeah. I want to be a part of the solution as much as possible. And yeah. so I'm using my voice to do that. And I really appreciate you um, inviting me and allowing me to share my perspective too, because I think that's really powerful. Um, but yeah, I am. I, I want to keep learning with everybody else. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this excerpt from my conversation with Alex. We actually ended up talking for more than an hour, so I just pulled some of the key ideas that she shared, and likely we'll be sharing more of our conversation in a future podcast. My favorite for this week is a brand new parenting masterclass series that I'm part of this summer. You can check out all the details by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting parentinginplacemasterclass.com. I'm thrilled to be part of this brand new collective of some of today's most prominent thought leaders in parenting, neuroscience, and well-being, whose books together have sold more than 3 million copies. We are passionate about helping families navigate these challenging times and have come together to share our very best strategies and ideas for how families can thrive this summer and be ready for whatever comes next. The live events will be held every Wednesday starting at 8 p.m. Eastern Time or 5 p.m. Pacific Time, and they started this week on June 10th and go through August 5th, 2020. When you register for the series, you get not only the ability to attend the live events and be part of the chat and ask questions, but you'll also have access to a bonus bundle and a closed Facebook group. And all of this is for only $39 for the entire series. I have already learned so much being part of this group, and I am really looking forward to each week's session, which are covering a variety of topics that are so important to all of us right now. As 
as always, you can find notes, links, and other resources related to today's conversation by visiting my website at sunshine-parenting.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for my email list so that you don't miss out on any of the great resources I have available for raising thriving kids. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate you sharing it with a friend. Please take a moment to give Sunshine Parenting a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's end with a quote from my book, Happy Campers. Regardless of your child's age, remember that their best practice ground for positive relationships starts with you at home. Siblings, cousins, and close family friends are our kids' first friends. And by coaching our kids through the ups and downs of those relationships, we are helping them gain important social skills that will benefit them throughout their lives. Seeing ourselves as our kids' friendship coaches reminds us that our most important job as parents is modeling and teaching our kids about how to form positive relationships. It is from parents that our children first learn how to connect with others. I'm Audrey Monkey. Thank you for joining me for the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. Join me again next week for more conversations about raising kids who become thriving adults.